This is Dr. Ruben Chen, and welcome to the Vital Signs Podcast. Hi, uh, this is Dr. Ruben Chen, uh, welcoming everybody to another Vital Signs Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. Uh, This is Dr. Kari Schaefer. She is a doctor of uh, Chinese medicine. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And we're going to be talking about uh, some things that I think are very important in just overall health today. And uh, Dr. Kari has a, a very unique background and great insight. And this is probably the thing that I love to talk about. And I can sort of geek out on it because I do love talking about uh, lifestyle and food and that type of stuff. So, uh, Dr. Kari, can you give us a little background about yourself and um, how, how you came to do what you do today? Sure, absolutely. So, my first health issue developed when I was 17, oh. and I had severe digestive uh, distress. I went to a medical doctor and they told me I had irritable bowel and that I just had to live with it and not to worry that I wouldn't starve. I mean, I wouldn't uh, die. I wouldn't get any, you know, cancer or anything. Mm -hmm. And, but don't eat fiber, which was probably, well, actually in retrospect, when you understand what, what I ended up having wasn't a bad, uh, a bad recommendation, but for, for IBS, that's not a great recommendation. So I went about, uh, yeah, right. (laughs) Kind of the opposite. Yeah. I think he read part of the pamphlet that said don't eat fiber during acute attacks but not like then try to introduce it or something so <laughs> okay. I don't know so I went away and I was like okay I have to live with this and so I started um, eating to manage it and basically what that meant was the less food I ate the less I um, had what I called stomach attacks um, because I had severe constipation and oh. so I would eat like one meal a day and at the time mm. I was modeling so I was thin Okay. But those, that's yeah, kind of work. It kind of worked out, right? Nobody right. was, you know. Um, and um, but the problem was, I got really malnutritioned, mm-hmm. and then I wasn't. Absor- so so when I started going back to school, I um, uh, I took a class in nutrition. And I put in what I was eating, and I was like, "Holy moly, I'm putting in enough to starve to death." <laughs> so I started eating three meals a day from that point, and my mm-hmm. my irritable bowel symptoms improved in general, but. That my digestion wasn't great. Mm-hmm. So I had this like underlying low level of malnutrition. Um, and I, I went to, I remember going to this one doctor and him drawing blood and, and he's looking at my blood and he's like, you have an eating disorder. And I'm like, I don't have an eating disorder, but he never asked me why I was eating the way I ate. He never asked me about my digestion. He just accused me. And so I, I never went back. So rather than getting support and help, I, I also, another time I went to a medical doctor And she, I was having these episodes where I like couldn't get off the bed. I was so, I was like, I couldn't move. And so I went to see her and she ran blood. She goes, well, you don't have hypoglycemia, but you're having hypoglycemic like attacks, but she didn't tell me to eat. (laughs) So so, so when they were saying that you were malnourished, uh, did they specify exactly what was missing from your diet or what was missing from your blood levels or anything or did they just well at that time I remember my cholesterol levels were super super low like Hmm. way lower than where they should be and you know I was probably borderline anemic and I'm sure my blood didn't look great but rather than saying hey what do you eat and why do you eat I was just accused of having eating disorder or my other doctor didn't accuse me that she just said oh you're having these hypoglycemic attacks don't worry about it but she never said Kari the solution for that is food (laughs) <laughs> so I went about managing my digestive um, problems on my own and, um, and, and created sort of this weakness in my system. And, and even though, like I said, at 28, when, so for 17 to 28, I ate this really erratic way. Uh-huh. And at 28, when I went back to, to school um, and learned that I was eating enough to starve to death, I started eating three meals a day, which of course helped. But I had created this underlying weakness in my system and this underlying wow. weakness in my system. And as you can imagine, skipping meals like that, what that does to the adrenals, right? It's one of the, I mean, we'll talk a little more about this, but this is one of the biggest things I see with, with women, particularly is this meal skipping that just taxes the adrenals. And then they just end up chronically adrenal exhausted. Well, that's the way um, a lot of people say, hey, I, I know how to lose weight. I just eat less. And you just start taking things out, not eating 
right. And yeah. people can lose weight and still eat. This is a... Yeah, yes. <laughs> it's actually really important. Like, I'm really not fond of in intermittent fasting in our culture because we're so yeah. stressed out and intermittent fasting aggravates to, from my perspective, I, I'm glad you said yes. I was, I real after I said, I was like, oh boy, I hope he's, he's not an intermittent faster, but <laughs> it aggravates that stress response in the body. So yeah. for somebody who's doesn't have, uh, you know, their body isn't under stress, then maybe intermittent fasting can help. And listen, if you're eating 20 hours a day, yeah, you've got to cut the numbers down. I mean, you know, you're just eating too much and right. too often. But for somebody who it, whose system is already stressed out, intermittent fasting, where you, you don't eat for several hours, just stresses the system out more. So back to my story. So then I got exposed to, it was, it's kind of like this, this like perfect storm where I got exposed to, I had this really cute 1963 convertible that turned out at a leaky gas tank. Wow. And I, and I was living in Southern California, so it wasn't a problem. But when I moved up North where it was cold and I put the top up all the time, <clears throat> that started, that made me started having some health issues from that. And then I believe it or not got exposed to black mold and Lyme's disease concurrently. Oh, so, so at age 32, I had a complete health crash uh -huh. and because I was so deficient and so toxic, nobody could help me. So I'd go to Chinese medicine and, and they would want to tonify me and mm -hmm. I'd get worse or I'd go to another doctor and he'd want to clear me clear out the toxins and I'd get weaker. Mm -hmm. And so nothing was working for me. And that's what started me sort of on my journey of looking for solutions was my own. And that's where I learned about whole food nutrition. And that was the first time I was able to take supplements like other, the, the nutraceuticals I, I was having trouble with. So I went, I learned about whole food nutrition and that started changing things. And that sort of sent me on the trajectory trajectory that I'm on now. At, at that point, I was already a clinician and practicing when wow. I, when I had my big health crash where I could literally walk like three blocks without I having to take a, a rest, having to sit down and waking up every day, feeling like I had a, the flu just in, in body pain. I didn't even know that it wasn't normal. I remember studying for my boards with my friend and we were talking about pain and I said, well, everybody has pain. And she said, no, <laughs> and I'm like, you don't have pain every day. Yeah. And she said, no, and I'm like, wait, wait a minute. I, Cause I was in pain every day and I didn't even know that that wasn't normal. Wow. So it was that journey to get myself back, put back together that, that took me down my road. It's interesting that you had such um, negative experiences with healthcare professionals, even Chinese medicine doctors, and yet you decided to enter a healthcare field. <laughs> well, be because I realized two things, not being well, I loved diagnostic tests because I wanted to know I didn't have a big, scary boogeyman, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think many people are like that. Not everybody, but many are like that. And I wanted something that would help me get better. Mm -hmm. So I did when in my earlier days, I did see an acupuncturist and they did help with the digestion and stuff. So it's not that everything was a negative experience. But I was like, I want to marry those two together. And that's basically what my practice looks like now. I do a combination of, of what we call functional nutrition with some Chinese herbology with um, functional medicine. So I kind of marry everything together. So I run lab tests. I look at the nutrition status. I look at their diet. I help them change their diet. We look a lot at lifestyle. And then we do a lot of um, emotional reprogramming to help people be able to choose the healthy food instead of the sticky bun, right? Because mm -hmm. the reason that most of us are choosing the sticky bun has nothing to do with nutrition. It has to do with an emotional need yeah. that we're trying to feed because somehow that feels uh, soothing to us, you know? So how did, how did you treat yourself then? Because uh, what you're saying, I, I think involves, uh, I, I, I see some patients with irritable bowel as well. And there is definitely um, some physiological issues, but there is an emotional and a physical issue usually combined as well. And I, I'm not, th there are some areas that I, I'm not super clear on. So I, how would you, address address that yeah good question so first of all i didn't have irritable bowel i had small intestine bacterial overgrowth or something called SIBO mm -hmm. and um but they didn't know about SIBO back then uh, um yeah. So I didn't actually get diagnosed with SIBO until many, many, many years later, but they, looking at my, my symptomology and then looking at 
the diet that I eventually came to eating to not have all this digestion, digestive distress, which isn't a diet you should live on long term because it's limiting. It's a SIBO diet. Like I was like, oh, this food doesn't work well. This vegetable doesn't work well. This, and I just sort of figured it out. And when I started as a clinician learning about SIBO, I was like, because I didn't have the bloating and the other and the constipation anymore because I, I had this SIBO S diet I was eating, but that was not feeding my body all the nutrients that it needed. Right. And so mm-hmm. it, it, when I started looking at, it, I was like, wait, wait, wait. And so I got tested for SIBO. That's actually how I found out I had Lyme's disease. Cause when I got a positive SIBO test, I was going to see this specialist in our area. That's a uh, gastroenterologist that specializes in SIBO, but he's going to run a Lyme's test. And so I was like, well, I might as well run that. And mm-hmm. sure enough, that was positive. Wow. So that was actually how I figured I had actually gotten myself much, much better before I figured out what it was that what what the problems were. Wow. Um, Which is interesting because they were just not tested at the time Lyme's disease. The solution was, you know, IV antibiotics, which was something I wasn't going to do. So my clinician said, why bother testing for it? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's been quite a journey um, uh, to figure this out. So to answer your question. Um, I first I came to whole food nutrition using a kinesiology based system. And for anybody who doesn't know what that is, you use a body, a muscle response to look for stress on the body. And mm-hmm. then you look for what nutrition is going to help alleviate that stress. So mm-hmm. that's what I came to first. And then, oh, actually, it was the other way around. I came to a technique called neuro emotional technique, speaking of the emotional piece and neuro emotional technique was developed by Dr. Scott Walker. It's a beautiful technique, where you actually go in through the physiology, again, using this kinesiology biofeedback system, and you figure out where there's stress on an organ system. And then you can find out why the stress is there, where it came from, and very quickly clear it. They've actually done, um, uh, they've used functional MRIs to do research on it, to show pre pre and post treatment, how it changes the brain. Mm -hmm. Super amazing stuff. If you're not familiar with it, you should look it up. So I came to NET first. So I started with the emotional pieces first, and then went into the, the nutrition, uh, the clinical nutrition piece with the whole food nutrition. And that's what started me on my path and then came to functional medicine. So I was just, you know, step-by-step step learning these tools that now make up the way that I practice today. Wow. So yeah, you did mention intermittent fasting and yes. all of the interesting fad diets that are out there. Um, yes. How do you address that with people uh, when they say, I had, I, I talked about this uh, actually with my, um, with my family once, and uh, I had a patient that came in and she had a very hard time losing weight. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, she said, you know, I just want to know physical activities that I should do. And I said, well, let's talk about your diet. And she's like, no, 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 I've, I've got a perfect diet. And a couple of times she would come back. She wasn't losing any weight. Then she said, I said, well, we really need to do at least a food journal and just sort of see where you're right. at. And she said, well, I'm a vegetarian. And I said, okay, so I, I don't know what that is supposed to mean. But so when she listed what she was eating, she was eating, she's probably consuming like 3,500 calories a day. Sometimes she would consume 2000 calories in one sitting. And so mm-hmm. she didn't realize that, um, you know, it, it's, uh, and, and everybody wants to say, oh, I'm doing this diet or that mm-hmm. diet. And therefore it is the, the paleo diet or the carnivore diet, right. or something or other. How, how do you address that with people uh, when they really are, are focused on, on, uh, on a specific diet? So on my YouTube channel, I go through all the different diets and what I like about them, what I don't. So I wrote a book called The Food Solution. And basically what I found, I micromanaged my diet for years and years and years. And I I realized that micromanaging diet wasn't going to be the solution Mm -hmm. to what was going on with me. It was helpful to eat a healthy diet. But when I was living up in Seattle, Washington, I was seeing a bunch of raw food diet people, they don't eat raw food. And from a Chinese medical perspective, that's a problematic diet, right? So, so, but what I was noticing with my raw fooders is they healed faster and got better quicker. And I was like, okay, so this goes against my training. So let me look into this more deeply. And what I found was people up there, at least that were doing raw food diets, ate all organic, everything was fresh. 
mm-hmm. right? No chemicals, yeah, no <laughs> additive, right? It has to be, right? right? And I was like, interesting. So that's what I started suspecting made the difference. So I started switching all of my clients to a whole food diet, getting all my, my books called The Food Solution, Skip the Chemically Ridden Altered Product, which the acronym is crap, right? And, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and thrive, like basically. But, but the, the premise, what I realized is it's not so much what we're eating, it's the quality of what we're eating that matters. So first thing that everybody I work with changes their diet, and they all have to read my book. And I don't actually care in the short run if someone wants to eat paleo or wants to eat um, keto in the short run. We eat a limited diet in the long run. Our microbiome, which are all the little bugs in our gut, there's trillions of them that keep us healthy and strong and vital. They need a variety of, of grains, legumes, and vegetables. Okay. Mm. So if we're cutting out those food groups entirely long term, we're actually starving those guys. Mm. And we'll predispose ourselves to certain health issues and weaknesses. Right. So I want somebody and now a lot of people who come to see me can't tolerate grains and legumes because they've got SIBO or some other digestive disorder. So for a period of time, those will come out. But the goal is to fix the digestion so that they can go back in. We're eating a a varied diet of whole food nutrition Mm -hmm. and um, and and the other diets you can, like I said, you can use short term for curative short term, two or three months. But using them long term, you create the potential for imbalances like I did in myself. So I'm diet is a big piece of what I do with people. Now I make them read my book. I used to blah, blah, blah at them, but I I got tired after saying the same thing after 20 years. Right. So I read, uh, I have them read the book and then they keep a diet journal and we go through and I will start, I'll say each week, like, can you get more vegetables in? I don't know why everybody needs to get more vegetables (laughs) in. Can we try this? Usually I'm having to decrease the amount of grain people are eating. And usually people are mono grain where they're eating, yeah. you know, toast for breakfast, pasta for dinner. It's right. And so wheat. it's wheat, yeah. wheat, 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 right. So we're looking for getting variety in and, and I, and I try to keep people down depending on the person and what their health issue is, but no more than one flour based product in a day mm-hmm. um, because flour um, is is fine if it's freshly made, but in this country, it's not freshly made. Those sacks of flour have been sitting around for months and months and months. The oil, <laughs> if, they, if it has, if it has any fiber left in it, the, the oils are rancid, it's old, it's moldy, it's whatever. So, you know, in Europe, you go often people who have food sensitivities here, go to Europe and they can eat anything and they're fine. But in Europe, you go and you buy a loaf of bread. And when we were in Italy for when we got married, my, I said, my husband asked the woman, how long will this bread keep? Cause we were, tra- we were traveling and she, the woman was like, Oh, like you know, I was going to come with French because I may, may one day. I mean, she was like, what do you mean? How long will it keep? Right. The idea of eating a loaf of bread the next day was absurd. Mm. Well, think of how long your loaf of bread sits in the refrigerator. I, right? You're telling me this right now. And I'm looking at the loaf of bread inside my kitchen. <laughs> That's nuts. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I literally buy this really expensive loaf of bread. It's it costs like eighteen dollars and fifty cents. It's this chestnut bread. It's really mm. beautiful. But I had it in my refrigerator for weeks, right? For a couple of weeks, you know, not in my refrigerator, but part in the freezer, fridge, whatever. But in Europe, that's unheard of because they're using really fresh flour. And the idea of eating this old stuff, they know it's not good wow. for us. But here, we've so lost the essence of food preparation, which is such an important piece. You know, grain isn't digestible because it has a nutrient that blocks your enzymes from working unless it's been fermented. So it's got to be sourdough. It's got to be fermented. Otherwise, you're eating something that your own that will block your own digestive enzymes from working. Right. Same Mm -hmm. thing with legumes. And we've lost that art here in the United States. We just like throw a bunch of chemicals in it and mill it up into flour and take out all the good stuff, the germ, and then fortify it because we know we take it out stuff and we expect people to be healthy. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know if if you know much about my background, but yeah. um, So Sunrider International is um, a company that my father started and it, uh, we create herbal health foods and that is actually, it's so great because that is the foundation of what we talk about is variety and whole food concentrates so that you get the most bang from the herbs and the other nutrients that you get, but the variety is the key. 
And I think, uh, especially with Western culture, they, they are very focused on like, uh, I need my protein and I need my fat and I need my carb. And then, and it's sort of interchangeable in their, in their mind. Whereas like, um, the Japanese uh, food pyramid per se, there right. is like nine colors every nice. meal of food. Nice. They can be from any kind of food, but they the colors are where, they, because they know that the color is where the antioxidants are and the nutrients are. And, and it's not the same vegetable too. So you have to have things that have this color and that color and a fruit maybe at this and and then some vegetable like this and maybe a meat and even different kinds of meat. So that's, so that is, uh, I, I I'd love to, I'd love to know this. You know, I studied, uh, 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 Kiko Matsumoto was one of my teachers, uh, Japanese style acupuncture. Uh, mm-hmm. That's what I practiced for years. I don't practice acupuncture anymore. And mm-hmm. so I didn't know your background. I probably should have done my homework. <laughs> so I'm so glad to know that. Um, and I spent four months in Japan when I was uh, younger mm-hmm. and, um, uh, you know, I will eat fish soup for breakfast and people are like, what? And I'm like, well, when I was in Japan, that, that's where I got, the, I got introduced to the idea that you don't have to eat sweet things or eggs and bacon that's for right. breakfast. You can eat anything for breakfast. And that's actually something that I teach many people. And the other thing I use as an example all the time is, you know, when you get a bowl of rice in Japan, which by the way, has is white so that it's because it's had that phytic acid removed, they knew this it's undigestible, Mm -hmm. right? And, and so it's more digestible. It's so funny that people love brown rice, but the white rice is actually better for you. It's actually much more easily digestible, right? Right, And and so that little, that little bowl of rice, right? And Mm -hmm. and the, and you look at the plates and things in, in Japan and they're small, you're not eating these like big old massive amounts of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have your little rice, but then you'll have your seaweed and you'll have your little fermented pickled thing. And you'll, you know, the variety, I mean, God, let's just take Japanese food and bring it to America. We'd all be doing so much better. So Japan actually, uh, and I did, I'm so funny. I didn't know Uh, Japan actually informed. And by the way, I love herbal medicine. I, I do practice it. I'm currently taking an herbal formula. It was just that when I was really sick, nobody was figuring it out it, the whole tough. the whole piece yeah and to translate that to western medicine can be difficult because um i think my personal experience is that um that the people who practice uh western medicine and people who practice eastern medicine use very different language so yes. they have a hard time communicating even though sometimes i feel like they're talking about the same thing but they're just using different terms for the same thing. And it's just, they're like talking past each other and it can be complicated. And that's well, probably I one think of the it's... things I have a struggle with because I'm a medical doctor, a Western medical oh, doctor. Okay. But I've also trained in acupuncture and Chinese medicine. And there is definitely that discussion to be had when I'm talking with an acupuncturist versus right. a Western medical doctor. Right. So right. Just use different language almost completely. <laughs> So yeah, and that's, I actually, that's why I went and studied functional medicine, because mm-hmm. functional medicine gives me the language that my patients will understand, right? Yes. And so me, me being able to interpret their lab tests that enables them to, they feel comfortable, like that's what they're used to, right? And I found mm-hmm. it a really, really helpful tool in helping people. Oh, I love, I, I should, I, I did, I should have read your background. I'm so sorry that I didn't. <laughs> no, that's, and I really like the functional medicine approach because I do think that if more Chinese medicine doctors would use a functional medicine approach and that kind of language, it would be much easier to translate it across because concepts of meridians right. and chi, that just, it, it's just right. not, but if you explain it in maybe more functional terms, people usually are able to at least comprehend it because that's that's the way that they're brought up here. So, well, yeah. it also helps me talk to medical doctors as well, right? Yeah. I can because I can bridge the two. So, yeah, very very helpful. So, um, so we were gonna talk a little bit, and I would love to bring it in a little bit about our current world. Yes. Yes, I was actually, that was my next question is yeah. um, people have been sort of sitting and you called it sticky butt, but people have been sitting <laughs> on their butts 
in front of these screens, which is, and I don't want to belittle it. I mean, this technology is amazing uh, yes. that we can still communicate even uh, during this tough time. But at least for me, my biggest concern is that you're living in this sterile environment and your body is just unable to handle certain stresses now. And there is some form of stress just sitting in front of this uh, device all day. Yeah. And obviously our diets are a mess. So, I mean, what, what are you seeing right now and, and how would you, how do you address those things? So I went from seeing clients in person to immediately going hundred percent virtual to which I've been hundred percent virtual ever since. So I went from standing up, sitting down, standing up all day to sitting down all day. Um, and it's a very real change on the body. You need, you need less calories, right? Yeah. Um, you need, um, and you have to then now have to add in activity because we're not even walking to our car. <laughs> For some people that used to be their activity to walk to their right. car, park and walk to their desk. They're not even doing that He's anymore. Walking around the office or something like that, right? right. Nobody's right. even doing yeah. those basic Now things. you're not doing that. Yeah. So, so, and then, and then we all live with our refrigerator. Yes. Right. So we didn't used to have our refrigerator go to work with us. Oh my gosh. Right. Right. So you can get access to snacks whenever you want. Whenever you want. Boy, those chocolate cover who almonds are really tempting in the middle of my day, I have to say, which I would not have those at work when I was at the yeah. So so I've seen two things. I've seen um people who have gone exercise crazy. I have people who are, you know, working out seven days a week throughout the whole, they're in better shape than they've ever been in. And then I have people who go exercise crazy and then COVID five and then exercise crazy and then COVID five. I find most people in my, in my world are only putting on about five pounds because we catch them before they go much further than that. But that, that fluctuation up and down. And then there's just the people who have put on the weight. So one of the most important things is what you have in the house, right? Because if it's not there, you can't eat it. Right. Yeah, sense. and don't and 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 the the thing I hear, oh, it's for the kids. Well, the kids shouldn't be eating it either because they're <laughs> sitting in front of the screen too. So, you know, so you just you just got to get it out of the house. Oh, but it's the emergency food. Okay, great, put it in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if if there's an emergency, I don't know if that's always the best food to have available either. Exactly right, but but you know, I hear that right. I do have my you know five pound bag of rice right my white rice but yeah. it's not it's in the garage it's not you know i'm not eating it every day um so um the the so yeah so those are important things you've got to i know a lot of people things are opening up so it's changing a lot of people were afraid to even go outside which i thought was was really too bad because fresh yeah. air is so important and and sunlight and yeah. You know, our, the air quality in our homes is, is. Oh, I haven't so, even thought about that. You're breathing in, you're just home air all of the time. That's not very good for you either. Oh. No, your air quality in your home is generally worse than the air quality outside. And yeah. then we, and then what I saw a lot of was chemical toxicity. I mean, the amount of people that reported a poison control, like I don't even know how high it like went up a hundred percent or something. Um, we're all, we were all, everybody was using all these, these wipes and, and all this Clorox and all of this. Yeah. And so their air quality was really awful in their home. And then they were locking themselves in. So, so simple things like stop using the Clorox at home. <laughs> you're, you're fine. <laughs> yeah. You can get yourself some vinegar and water. That'll work. You can get yourself some, you know, natural cleanser from, wherever and use that. I literally, I saw, I, I, I treated, I would say, I only saw a few COVID clients. And um, because if you're living a healthy lifestyle, you're not, if, even if you get COVID, it's mild, right? I saw a few COVID clients and I saw so many that had chemical toxicity. So many that that was the problems, chronic headaches and, yep. you know, body pains and things like that, that were coming from all the chemicals and then the inactivity and then the lack of fresh air. Wow. That, yeah. that actually is something I'm going to start recommending to people too. I, I didn't even think about the air that's in your house being more toxic than outside. 
Yeah, because we use so many chemicals inside. So what I tell people to do is all the chemicals go in the garage, they're out of the house. Um, you, you know, you don't need bleach, you can use those, you know, like the oxy brights or things like that to clean your clothes, um, just out of the house, because that stuff's all off gassing and you're breathing it, you don't need to be cleaning your counters with all that toxic stuff they all they, they they translate in the body into that well like chlorine is very hard on the lung tissue hello um I mean, we don't want to when you use lung- chlorine you're supposed to be wearing a mask just for that <laughs> right but then you're putting it on your counters and then your yeah. food is touching it right you're and um with it. Wow. i've seen so i over the years i've seen people with neuropathies that were coming from their chlorine use um yeah a lot i do a lot of identification of of toxins like that and um and so uh really getting people to get to where they feel safe enough where they don't need to use those chemicals to stay well i literally people i used hand hand sanitizers only when i was absolutely forced to i otherwise i did no extra cleaning in my house I traveled. I did sanitizers. They actually propagate more dangerous bacteria too, and that's right that you see yeah. in a lot of uh, gyms. Uh, I, I practice also Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and nice. that, that was something that some of the gym owners had mentioned is that some of their chemical uh, cleansers actually cause uh, them to get uh, flare-ups of MRSA because. Um, you know, the, right. other, the other bacteria would be killed off and you're just left with these super bugs and uh, some guys would get cellulitis from that. So that's, you know, right. you yeah, that you don't think about because you think, well, you know, getting rid of all the bugs and doing my duty type of thing. Like at Sunrider, we, we actually have herbal cleansers as well. Uh, and, nice. And that is... That's something um, that's important, I think, to clean off. You, you can clean some bacteria off, but some bacteria is, you know, not all bacteria is bad. Bad. No, we uh, listen, we're more bacteria, fungus, parasite than we are, than we, um, than we are human cells. So no, we need our healthy microbiome. That's great. Okay, people. So there's your answer. Get his herbal cleanser products instead of using those. Yeah. Uh, the, the nasty ones. That's a huge first step because again, we're, we're not eating right. We're getting exposed to so many um, chemicals. I, I was in down in Mexico at a conference um, during COVID, I know, um, but they were literally coming into your room and washing your floor with bleach while you're out of the room. Oh my God. They were, they were pouring bleach over all the lounge uh, furniture out, out by the pool. Um, crazy. Um, so yeah, so, so people don't think about that. So we really want to think about that. We've got to get ourselves moving again. We've got to get, so I'll in between clients, I stand up and walk around my, yeah. in my office even, right. Yeah. I, I have windows in my office. I, you know, have those open, um, as much as possible. I have an air purifier just mm-hmm. because we do have to be careful about that, that interior plants, plants are great for, yeah. um, right clean up the air cleaning up the air yeah so now that people are getting out and about uh, yes um, i i know that there is still hesitation out there um what what is advice that you have for people as they are embarking some i mean i've talked with so many people who said you know i went to a restaurant for the first time in 15 months and so I, i mean what what kind of advice do you have for people that are getting outside Well, the thing for people to remember is that COVID is particularly detrimental to those people who are living unhealthy lifestyles. So people who are, so people always say, oh, he got sick, but he was totally healthy. Mm, I bet if we looked, he wouldn't have been healthy by your and my standards. In other words, if he's eating the standard American diet, he's not going to be really healthy, Mm. right? Or she. So you want to really look at cleaning up your diet and really look at getting in whole food nutrition. You want to look at getting movement back into your life so that because even the vaccine only works. And this, I guarantee you, this is going to be coming out. 
The vaccine only works in those people that have a healthy immune system, yeah. right? Or, or the, or, yeah. and so it's your immune system that protects you from COVID, whether yeah. you use the vaccine to stimulate it or whether you get COVID, right? It's yeah. your immune system that's going to protect you. So it's, it, so taking good care of yourself is your best weapon. <laughs> it's your best defense mm-hmm. um, in, because, you know, this is a new era and we, we don't know if, if this is a one up or if we're going to, you know, there's going to be something else or whatever. So the best thing that we can do is really educate ourselves about what it does, what it really means to be living a healthy lifestyle. What is, what do bodies really, really need? They've got to be moving. Why? Because so many organ, so many of their systems depend on movement. They depend on muscle contraction to flush out the lymph fluid. What is the lymph fluid? It's where immune challenges get taken to get broken down. If your lymph fluid's all gunked up, not working well, your immune system's not working well, right? And that depends on muscle contraction in order to do that. So you've got to get your booties moving, people, if you want to have your lymph system working well right? Your um, fluid exchange. So we are intracellular and extracellular inside your cells and outside fluid has to move in and out. That all depends on movement and pressure to do that. If we're sitting around, that's not happening. You're getting a bunch of waste built up in your cells. That waste um, has a bunch of toxins in it. You're not going to be healthy. Um, We all know about, you know, you need to move for your heart and your circulatory system, but there's so many other reasons. Your brain sitting all day long, your brain's not getting good blood circulation to it, your brain cells are going to get sluggish and, and, and start to die off your low back, your spinal column doesn't have um, a pump in it, in order to get nutrition in in your spinal cord to to nourish your spinal cord, the most important thing in your body, right? If you don't have a spinal cord, you, you know, you can't function. Um, that's all based on movement. So movement is so critical. People think like, oh, I have to exercise. No, take that out of it. You got to move and preferably non-linear. So, you know, arms are up and over. That's why I love yoga or, or, or the martial arts, non-linear movement, because everything is getting stretched and squished and you're you know going upside down. And so everything's getting circulated. So you don't want to think about moving. You want to think about as much as, or exercising as much as circulating, right? That's what movement is for us to circulate everything. And then of course, breath, you know, this being, you know, your background, right? How important breath is. And in Chinese medicine, breath is life. And the more shallow you breathe, the, the shorter your lifespan. So, you know, COVID hits these lungs, right? So we want to Make sure that we're getting an air. We're sitting on a sofa hunched over. That diaphragm's getting cut off. That lung capacity is getting shut down. You're breathing in the top part of your lungs. You're going to be more prone to having uh, some respiratory troubles, right? And then we talked about the nutrition, um, making sure that we're getting a uh, well-rounded diet of of whole food nutrition and, um, and making sure that there's a lot of variety in it. So those are really the key that create the foundation for you to be a healthy person, regardless of COVID or, you know, or, or what, what else. And then the point that you made that I'd, I'd love to make again is that when we are exposed to people and things, our immune systems get work, they get exercised mm-hmm. and they get stronger. Yeah. When they- we isolate and we wear, you know, we come up and we sleep for, you know, on and on and on and on, we don't get exposed to those, uh, those, those low level immune challenges that keep our immunity strong. So if you've been isolated for 15, you know, months, don't make the first thing you do go to a party with 30 people. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's what's going to happen is that I know they're like with like a hundred people and then they come home and they're sick and they don't know why that happened. And then they're going to think, well, I'm going to isolate myself for another five or six months. And that's just a mess. No, right. No. So start with walks outside, Mm -hmm. start with one or two people, let your immune system start to get used to, you know, it be, you know, if you can be unmasked. So, So your immune system starts to get exposed 
to low levels of microorganisms and it can start to wake up again and go like, oh, it gets stronger and stronger. And then you can increase the size, you know, don't make a Dodger game or something. The first thing that you do out of, out of quarantine, that's just not smart. It's just not a nice thing to do for your body. It's going to be like, whoa, what is going on here? <laughs> wow. And I know that people are chomping at the bit to get out into, into public, but I like the idea, uh, take baby steps, let your body get used to it. Just like anything, um, your immune system does need to get worked out. Just like uh, if you hurt your leg or something and you don't just go from your leg is hurt to I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow. Yeah, people don't realize that that the isolation actually makes their immune system a little bit flaccid, a little weak. And, and so we need to we need to create opportunity for low level exposure um, as the body, uh, gets back online and used to it and used to handling it. Right. You know, original inoculation before vaccines came from the dirt. It came when kids would in countries that had low levels of polio, when they tested the dirt, there was polio in the dirt. Right. Um, so the kids would get exposed to the stuff in the dirt. Now our dirt nowadays has so much chemicals and whatever in it that, yeah, the idea we don't not so fond of our kids playing in, but if you can get your kid out into nature and let them play in the dirt a little bit, that's actually how, how our immune systems get stronger. So same as same applies with us, you know, go out little by little. If you've been locked up, get start, you know, getting fresh air without a mask, preferably so that you're breathing in little bits of things <laughs> and your body can be like, Oh, look, there's that pollen. Oh, look, yeah. you notice that people with like allergies are going crazy because they haven't been exposed to anything. So their immune system's like, ah, what's all this? No, it's important for people. And that's one of the things that, and that it, it's important to take off the mask when you're going outside at least and not yes. have the mask on all of the time because you do need to inhale some of these um, microorganisms so your body gets used to that. Not, I mean, yes. and, and not to say that if you are immunocompromised uh, to do something foolish like that. Uh, obviously right. if there are issues, you're immunocompromised. Um, that's, that's something separate. But for the average person, they do, you know, they're it's good to take off that mask and go outside and get some fresh air. Uh, and uh, I guess, I, I guess lots of fresh air. <laughs> yes. Lots of air. And again, we're not talking about walking into the, going to the farmer's market with a ton of people and, you know, it followed your, follow your government guidelines, but you know, it, 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 but, but you're walking down the street and there's nobody around, take your mask off. You're out in a park by yourself, take your mask off, you know, when yeah. it is, uh, when it is recommended and safe to do so. Um, but yeah, fresh air is super important. So that's, that's really what I would say for people introducing is step-by-step step, not, and we're not talking about a year step-by-step, step, you know, <laughs> like, you know, first few times you meet people, you have this and, you know, do that for a few weeks and then you, and then maybe go to something a little bigger and, you know, step-by-step, step. but we do have to, at some point, get out of the isolation because that does, like we said, our, our immune systems get a little sleepy. Yeah. But I like your, I like your more comprehensive approach because yeah. we're talking about not just diet, uh, but mm. you're talking about exercise, movement, um, mm-hmm. and also your surroundings, which is something that I don't think a lot of people think about the kind of things that cleaning your countertops with, uh, stuff that you're putting on your hands, uh, and, and yeah. the, the things that are around you. So that, that is, that's super important too. Did you make an herbal hand sanitizer? We do actually. Oh, can you send me, <laughs> can you send me a links to all that? Because I, people have been asking me and I haven't had, haven't had recommendations. So that's great. Well, you can come to our website at sunrider.com, but we will, okay. I'll have uh, our people uh, contact you. And we'll that's great. Yeah, no, that's great because I'll, I'll start sending it to people because it's a, uh, as people head out, their tendency to want more hand sanitizer will increase and they need to have other alternatives, I think, than, than, than just the, the chemical ones. So definitely. Yeah. But yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for uh, sharing some of your experiences and your opinions and stuff. It's, it's nice to have other kindred spirits out there that look at yeah. the world in this way. Um, yeah. can you, uh, so you have a book and you yeah. also have a way, how do can you uh, share again what your book is and how people can uh, get to know sort of uh, your, your approach and stuff? 
Sure. So my book is The Food Solution. Mm -hmm. It's available on Amazon. And my name is Kari Schaefer. And um, my website is sustainablehc.com, sustainablehealthcenter.com. Um, or actually, let's do an easier one. It's, it's Kari, C-A-R-I, number four, health, H-E-A-L-T-H dot com. And um, they can just go there and check out what I'm up to. And the, there's a there's the book. And then there's a course that goes with the book. If you want, if you want to walk yourself, you know, self through the book. And then there's a um, there's a detox diet detox in the course where I t- where they go through el- an, basically an elimination diet for three weeks, which will help them lose that weight, help them clean up their diet, and then they'll reintroduce Uh, food groups, and then they can see if they have any food sensitivities. Um, So that's all in there as well. And that's a nice way to get people to get jump started on that, that uh, the COVID five or 10 or 15, uh, uh, you know, getting yourself back helps you break those sugar cravings, helps you just sort of reset everything. And then yeah, you, uh, you kind of add, add back in. And then after you've read the book, you'll know what you're adding back in is that whole food nutrition. So it really helps you reset the diet. So that might be something that's helpful for people right now as well. Awesome. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure being here. Yeah, definitely. And uh, we'll definitely have to do this again sometime. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.